Good morning. Good to see. Good to see each of you here this morning. And I invite you to, to um, follow along as we read the text from Mark 14. Last week, I wasn't here, but I know that, um, I mean, I believe that uh, Mike, well, he told me he did, uh, preached on Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now we are following up right after that, verse 43 uh, to verse 52 of Mark chapter 14. Follow along as I read. <clears throat> and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So here we have the account of Judas betraying Jesus. And as we, as you think of Judas, um, you know, you, you don't have good thoughts, right? Here's a man that did a horrendous thing. He was a follower of Jesus. He was one of the 12. He was with Jesus for possibly three years. And here at the end, the Jews wanted to destroy Jesus. Jesus was a problem to them. He was constantly getting in their way of what they wanted to do. And so the Jews wanted to get rid of him, but they weren't able to. And, and for some reason, Judas, even though he was chosen by Jesus, went to them and said, I'll, I'll help you in getting rid of Jesus. And they, and they offered him money. And so we have the account here of Jesus taking this group of men there to, uh, to Jesus. And, um, and then they seized him and led him away. Now, the th one of the things I'd like us to think about this morning, and that is how that, as horrible as what this is, what Judas did, that we're like Judas in many ways. Now, hopefully none of us are here, uh, none of us here are like Judas in that he died without Christ. But we have a sinful heart each one of us, just like Judas. And I think when you hear of a person doing a horrible crime, we tend to think of them as, as um, you know, really way out there. But the reality is there really isn't much difference between us and the person who, who does a horrible crime. Now, let's look at this as how we are similar to Judas. Well, first of all, um, he said yes to following Jesus. I mean, think about that. He said yes to following Jesus. Uh, he would have preached and healed people and cast out demons when Jesus sent out the 12. He would have preached the gospel of the kingdom. He would have prayed for people. Um, he chose to listen to Jesus and would have heard what the other disciples were hearing. He, he, he heard all this preaching about the kingdom. And some of us have done the same thing. You know, we have prayed for people and they experienced healing. We've preached the, the gospel of the kingdom. And, um, <clears throat> and we also have joined the fellowship of believers, just like Judas did. 
Now, what about his sins? And I can identify with the sins that Judas, um, some of the sins that, Ju that Judas committed. And <clears throat> first of all, he betrayed Jesus. Now, at first, you probably say, well, I'd never do that. I'd never betray Jesus. But what was the betrayal? Well, the betrayal was that, <clears throat> I believe, that Judas was deceived by the enemy in, in thinking that he was doing the right thing. I, I think Judas thought he was doing the right thing. I don't know what his thinking process was. But he ended up going along with what Satan wanted to do. And what did Satan wanted to, want to do? He wanted to destroy Jesus. Um, Satan is out there. He's an enemy of God. He's, he's out there wherever the kingdom of God is, a, is, is, um, is um, Satan is there. And so Satan knew that Jesus was the son of God and he wanted him to just destroy it. And Judas, being deceived by Satan, went along with what Satan was doing and did his part in, in just going along with what Satan uh, wanted to do. How are we guilty of doing the same thing? Well, one of the ways that we do this, I, I, I say we, I know I have done this, is to speak evil of somebody else in the body of Christ, another brother or sister. And the way it works is um, I or we see somebody that is doing something that is wrong. And we and then going to somebody else and talking about that. Now, the danger in that is that <clears throat> Satan is at work to destroy the body of Christ. And so he will do that in different ways. And one of the ways is by um, using one who is part of the body of Christ in bringing accusation against another. And when we do that, and Satan is at work um, putting it into our minds, we often distort it. We have some truth, but there, we don't see the whole truth. And so we become a tool of the enemy in bringing discord and disunity in the body of Christ. And we may say, but it's true. But again, the enemy is, is at work in us um, and he will use, and, and his intent is to destroy the body of Christ. I thought of sharing this uh, over a week ago and then I thought, oh, I'm not sure that I should tie that in with betrayal. But then I had to think about how, as I read the Bible, sins that, um, that, that God speaks about, some of them that I think aren't that serious, yet in God's eyes, they really are serious. And then also I was speaking with another brother from another church and he was talking about his church. And he said, in our church, he said, speaking against another person in the church is right up there with the sin of adultery. Now, I don't know that they actually said that, but he was saying that, that they really count that a serious sin. He said, there are churches that are destroyed because of scandal, you know, scandal in the leaders, sexual immorality. But he said, there's a lot more that has been destroyed because of people speaking against each other. So what should we do if we see somebody sinning, somebody? And you know what? It's just not somebody that's sinning. It's somebody that you just are irritated with. And we can talk about that. What should we do? We should pray. That's what we're to do. We should bring them to the Lord rather than verbalizing it to somebody. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I see this in this individual. It's not right. And I ask that you work in their heart and change them. And also, if the Lord wants you to go to them and speak to them, then go and talk to them. But don't go to somebody else. Don't go to somebody else. 
Now, you can challenge me on this. I think it's a little different if it's with your spouse. If you share it with your spouse with a right heart, um, I think that within couples you can you can share if you are going to pray together about the situation. And if you don't share it just as a way of of um, you know putting the person down. And also, <clears throat> just going back to this of Satan being being the accuser, uh, I read this then from Zechariah three, um, one to five, and this is uh, Zechariah was a prophet that was speaking to the people of is uh, the people of Judah when they were restored back to Jerusalem after going into exile to Babylon. And this is what he said. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right hand to accuse him. See there? Satan standing at the right hand to accuse Joshua, the high priest. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now, a brand plucked from the fire is not very pretty. It doesn't have much value. He's not, a, he's not an oak of righteousness. He's a brand plucked from the fire. Now, Joshua was standing before the Lord clothed with filthy garments. So Satan had a grounds for accusing him, right? But the Lord wouldn't allow him to do that. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And he said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put on a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now, I share this acknowledging that I have been guilty of this and and I want to repent of this. Why? Because a person who has been received by Jesus Christ is made clean. Yes, there is sin, but there is sin in in all of our lives. And so we can't put ourselves up in judgment of someone else that Christ has made clean. And yeah, we are to be a means of building others up in the, in, in the body by um, at times going to them and saying, hey, I see this in your life. It doesn't look right. What about this? But go for the purpose of building up, not going to somebody else and tearing them down. Another sin that Judas was guilty of that I must confess I'm guilty of, and, and I imagine some of you are too, was that he was a hypocrite. If you look at verse 45, and when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Now, that was a sign, a kiss was a, back then was a sign of special affection among family members and close friends or of a disciple's honor and affection for his teacher. Judas had the intent of being a means of, Je of Jesus being seized and, and being taken by, the one, by his enemies. But he came and acted like a friend. And so how, how are we, how am I guilty of this, of the same thing? Um, when we tell Jesus we love him in our songs and prayers, but in our hearts, we're not fully yielded to him and not fully committed to him. So Sunday morning, you know, everybody around us is singing these songs and, you know, singing songs of, of adoration and praise. And, 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 um, and that's good. God wants us to worship him. He wants us to worship him. But if if it's only we're only doing it because everybody else is doing it 
and because it's the right thing to do here, but the rest of the week, I'm not committed to Jesus Christ. I'm not, I'm not yielded to him. Then that's being a hypocrite. And so what we need to do is not sing, but we need to acknowledge to the Lord, Lord, I know my heart isn't right. I know I'm not fully yielded to you. Um, I confess that. I, I want to be able to be sincere as I sing these songs of, of, of uh, adoration. And I know sometimes, sometimes we, um, we just don't feel like singing. We just don't have the, 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 the feelings of, of, of uh, adoration. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's a hypocrite to say, even though I don't feel like doing this, but I know that I should. And you're yielded to Christ. You're, you're, you're wanting to serve him. And so you sing, not because you have the feeling, but because you know it's the right thing to do. Am I clear on that? But there's another thing of doing it without not being yielded to Christ. So we see here, Judas doing what he did. And now the next part is something that I hope um, none of us experienced what Judas experienced. And that was, that is, that Judas, Satan, entered Judas. We read that in John. Satan entered Judas. Now, are we in danger of Satan entering us? I want to say, anybody that's been born of God, there has been a work of God's grace that you have come to Jesus. You have believed in him as the Savior, your Savior and your Lord, and you have been born again. There is a protection over you from the enemy, and Satan, I don't believe, can enter you. You are safe and secure. He is the, Jesus is a good shepherd. And when you come to him, you are secure in him. So we can ask the question then, what happened that Judas, who was chosen by Jesus and was one of the 12, came to a place where Satan entered him? How, how do you explain that? Well, I believe that a person can be very much involved in the life of, of the kingdom of God, the church, be involved in activities, be involved in actually doing the work, just like Judas did. He was very, very involved. He was with the 12. But I don't believe Judas came to the place of really knowing who Jesus was. He, he, knew, he knew about Jesus, but he didn't experience Jesus as being the Messiah, the answer to his sin problem, that Jesus is the Lord of all, he didn't, he didn't understand that. And that is a danger for any of us who can be involved in church life and church activity and everything appears to be okay, but you've really never come to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. That you, I, am a sinner. I am completely without any standing before God because I'm a sinner. And, and before a holy God, I have no, no standing. The best I can do is like it says about Joshua, had filthy garments and just uh, a, a brand uh, um, plucked from the fire. That's who we are. But in Jesus Christ, we take on his righteousness. We become righteous, not, not of ourselves, but the righteousness of Jesus becomes ours when we receive Jesus and we yield ourselves fully to Jesus Christ. So you may say, well, I'm not sure if I'm in Christ. I would say to you, Jesus wants you. He wants to be your Savior and Lord. Go to him and tell him, Jesus, I want you. I need you to be my savior. I receive you as my Lord, the one that is in control of all. And you have, 
I give myself to you for you to have absolute control and have your way in me. And Jesus is ready to receive you. He, he's not hard. He, he's not, it's not hard to come to Jesus. Okay, I'm not saying that right. It is hard to come to Jesus. But when you come to him, he is ready to receive you. And he wants you to come. Uh, the enemy is trying to keep you from coming to Jesus. There is a battle that goes on. But coming to Jesus, he readily receives you and takes you, uh, takes us just as we are. Now, more on that. Um, this is just a note. Um, verse 40, 44. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man sees him and lead him away under guard. And I just want to make an observation here. I, I, I never noticed this before, but I thought Judas was kind of, you know, just kind of tagging along and, and he wasn't really giving leadership. And then at the very end, then they said, hey, now Judas, who is this man? Judas is giving leadership to this because he says, he tells them, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. Judas is being controlled by Satan and giving leadership in this. Now, looking at that that um, phrase, um, now the betrayer, now the betrayer, the name that is given to Judas is betrayer. Now think about that. Peter denied Jesus and I mean, we remember that Peter denied Jesus, but he's not given the name. We don't remember Peter um, as it, that's it. Peter is a denier and that's it. No, but because Jesus gave, um, uh, Peter's name was Simon, but he, Jesus gave him the name Peter, which is rock. And, and Peter, even though he denied Jesus, came on to be the man in which the church was started. He was a rock. He, they of Pentecost, you know, all the disciples were there. Jesus, uh, yeah, Peter stepped up and he preached the gospel, powerful message. 3,000 people were saved. And so <clears throat> thinking about this, all of us have done the shameful things. And there is a name that Satan would have us believe about ourselves. Um. What name does the devil want you to believe about yourself because of some shameful thing you have done? Hypocrite, backstabber, Pharisee, cruel, deceiver, lustful, fornicator, adulterer, gossip, fearful, unfaithful, and maybe something else. When we come to Jesus confessing our sin and believing in his shed blood for us and receive him as our Lord and Savior, we receive a new name. We receive a new name. Um, and I just want to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But, thank God for that word, but. But you were washed. And when you wash something, what do you do? You make it clean. And so we are washed by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And you were sanctified. When you're sanctified, you're set apart. You're set apart for God. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. What does it mean to be justified? It's just as if you didn't sin. Not only are you forgiven, but in the eyes of God, it's just like you, you didn't sin at all uh, because you have taken on Jesus Christ and he is your righteousness. And then also um, Revelation 2, 17. And this is to the church of Pergamum. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. 
and I will give him a white stain with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now think about this. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. This is Jesus. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. When something's written in stone, it's permanent. And that's the name that will endure. The name that Jesus gives us because we have come to him and we belong to him. Um, just along with that, there was um, a song that I, I remembered and I wrote the lyrics down. I, I won't sing it because uh, it may not go well, so I'll read the lyrics. <laughs> I was once a sinner, but I came, pardoned to receive from my Lord. This way I was, this way I was freely given, I, and I found that he, that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white, white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. My sins, with my sins forgiven, I'm bound for heaven, never more to roam. That's what, um, that's what Jesus does for us. Gives us a new name. Now, Satan will remind us of the sins of the past. And, you know, it's not faith to go back and and believe that. We can say, okay, that's who I was, but I now am in Jesus, and that's no longer part of me. I now belong to Jesus Christ, and I have a new name. What's my new name? I'm a child of the King. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am, I am here to be holy, to be set apart for God, for his purposes. Now, um, I just want to say that um, the sad part about Judas was not that he sinned. I mean, that is sad. I shouldn't say that. The saddest part about Judas was not that he sinned, but that he didn't come to Jesus. And Judas is, according to the Bible, is in hell. And this morning, the, the, the sad part, I mean, it is sad that we're sinners. But the saddest part is if we don't really come to know Jesus. Um, and here's another song that I, I just like the lyrics about this. Because we need, you know, we're living in this world where um, all we see is the material things. And we do see create we do see creation, but we just need to see Jesus. We need to have a greater revelation of Jesus. And and this song says that, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly longing into thy likeness to grow, thirsting for more and deeper communion, yearning thy love more fully to know. And this part I really like. Open the wells of grace and salvation. Open the wells of grace and salvation. Pour the rich streams into my heart. Pour that grace and salvation into my heart that I can grasp it, that I can believe it, that I can live in that and not in unbelief and, and just the, all the chaos and the drama of this world. Open the wells of grace and salvation. Pour the rich streams into my heart. Cleanse and refine my thought and affection. Seal me and make me pure as thou art. We see here, this is kind of going back, but I'll just mention it. Because of Judas giving into this sin, what happened? Jesus was seized. And we see down in verse 20, 51, a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. When you seize somebody, they're being abused. There's violence. And by us giving into sin, 
we can be the means of others being hurt and, and being abused. Well, then we read in verse 48, and Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. They wanted to seize Jesus before, but they couldn't because it wasn't his time. Jesus knew that this was necessary, that he allow himself to be seized. I mean, he's God. He could have, he could have called, he said this, I could have called 12 legions of angels and 12 legions of angels would have been in the Roman army. That would have been 72,000 soldiers. So think of what 72,000 angels could have done. I mean, um, but Jesus said, um, he said here, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. If Jesus had not allowed himself to be seized and go the way of the cross, you and I would be in hell. All we would have to look forward to is hell. Jesus went there because I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. And we needed a savior. And the father had planned this from they had planned it. Father and the Son had planned this before the creation of the world, before sin came, that there would be a Redeemer. And Jesus knew what the scriptures had said, that this, that the Messiah would be the one that would deliver people from the enemy, the enemy Satan, and that there would be redemption, there would be salvation. And he knew that the cross was needed and necessary. And so Jesus said, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus was obedient and now there is hope, there is salvation for us. And I want to say also for us, God wants scripture to be fulfilled in us. What, what does it mean to have scripture fulfilled in us? It means that we obey the scripture. We don't go our own way. You know, we're used to going our own way, you know, something happens and okay, this is what I'm gonna do. But God is calling us to be like Jesus and to be, to be mindful of what the scripture says. We should first of all know what the scripture says. We should be reading the Bible. We should be, what you're doing here, listening to the word being taught. And so rather than just going on our own understanding and our own way of dealing with life, be, be submitted to the scriptures and choosing to do what scripture says. And so just like Jesus um, did, what are you facing in life that is really difficult and you want to escape from it? But the will of the Father is for you to accept and say as Jesus did, but let scripture be fulfilled. Uh, some examples may be a physical handicap. Now, I think we should pray and ask for the Lord to heal us. But if he doesn't, that we accept the fact that this is what God intends for me and I will be joyful. I will not give in to um, bitterness and complaining. A difficult person to work with. Well, maybe you do need to find another job, but if, if it's clear that no, you should stay, then live with that, work with that individual in the way that scripture says, and that is to consider others more important than yourself. Mike shared on that last night. Um, um, uh, but loving, you know, choosing to love. A difficult time in your marriage. Know what scripture says. Husbands, love your wives. And wives, submit to your, your husbands. And to be faithful to those vows till death do us part. Financial loss. Let scripture guide you if you're in time of financial loss. Loss of a friend rejection by peers, and the list could go on. But as we face life's challenges, that we live lives, that scripture is being fulfilled in us. So um, as we do this, we trust him in the circumstance to learn of his grace, to endure, die to self, and to have joys and trials. So just summing up this message, Judas did a horrible thing, but we're like Judas, or I'm like Judas, 
in some of the sins he committed. And I need Jesus. The main, the main message this morning is, don't be like Judas in missing who Jesus is. Make it your, your highest priority in life that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're here this morning and, and you're not sure, I, I, you know, I just urge you to go to him in prayer. And if you want someone to talk to about this, you know, Pastor Michael would be glad to talk with you. If he's talking with somebody, um, feel free to come to me. But make sure that you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And then live a life of, of learning to know him and, and not living in the past of who you, who you are. Maybe you still are struggling with some of these sins. But take who you are, that I have a new name. I belong to Jesus now. I, that, I, I, I'm not going to go that way. I now belong to Jesus. And then commit yourself to being one who fulfills scripture. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your word would have its way in our hearts and our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.